thank you very much for, for coming for my presentation. Um, this is my first time doing this, um, but I'm really excited to be here with you. First of all, by way of introduction um, and maybe a little disclaimer, um, I am not a trained curator, um, but I do have a background in um, theater design, art history, art studio from my undergrad at Williams College. Um, I spent over a decade doing prop design and prop sourcing and set dressing, creation of stuff uh, for, for theater on and off Broadway and for TV. I have experience with trade show installation, materials exhibition. I've worked as an image editor on um, design lectures and presentations and dealt with content. Um, and then as an archivist, I actually worked with the Roundabout Theater Company and La Mama um, experimental theater company, both here in New York City. And in those cases, I was working with uh, records of productions and, and uh, some of them I had worked on from a props point of view beforehand. And now I'm the archivist librarian at, at the New York School of Interior Design. So I'm, I'm coming at, uh, I'm going to show you these exhibition projects. I'm coming at them with from a lot of experience from a lot of different angles. And so hopefully it will be helpful for you to hear about some of that. So um, it's going to be three parts to the presentation today. The first section is going to cover a physical exhibition that was here at NYSED. It was on view last fall um, called Designing Duo, Tom Lee and Sarah Tomerlin Lee. And I'm going to talk about that, sort of the process of that, and specifically the ways that I collaborated as the archivist um, with the other members of, of the team. And then the second part I'm going to talk about my own design process in creating a parallel Omeka exhibition site. And then finally, we're going to have a, a little shorter section just with some general kind of design curatorial tips uh, for when you're creating your own little exhibitions in a library. I say little, but it could be a case or maybe something a little bit bigger. Uh, just some things that I have gleaned uh, from my experience about that. So first of all, uh, by way of explaining a little bit about the New York School of Interior Design archives, the archives here were founded in 2013, so relatively recently, and really it was um, pulling together material to celebrate uh, NYSED Centennial, which was in 2016, they were going to have a centennial publication. And so the archives were created by, you know, gathering material from around the building that documented the 100 year history of the school. Our main collection is the NYSED Institutional Archives, but we also have approximately 10 other collections as well. Um, our archives here are focused specifically on interior design and interior design education, which I think makes us pretty unique, at least in the US, uh, that we have such a specific focus to our archives. And so um, the other 10 collections, you know, are interior designers, records, furniture design, wall covering and textile design, um, largely visual material. We have uh, renderings and design paintings and lots of architectural drawings and other sorts of visual materials here. So how the whole exhibition thing began in the fall of 2020, well, and really basically since I started as archivist here at NYSED in 2019, I really just wanted to let our student body and just the NYSED community in general know what we have. I'm sure many of you struggle with this as well. You know, sort of, we have all this amazing stuff and like, how do we let people know that it's there and get them to actually use it? I had this desire to try to incorporate the archival material into the NYSED curriculum. And so um, in an outreach effort, I created a LibGuide and um, sort of explaining just like, what are archives? Like, why are they interesting? What are primary sources? And then also highlighting the major collections that we have and sort of giving ideas about ways that students might be able to use that material in their projects. Like, you know, is a collection focused on color and how could you research color and, and use that in your interior design projects? So I created this LibGuide and I um, presented it to uh, the Library Advisory Committee here at NYSED and then also the Archives Advisory Committee in January, 2021. As a result of that, after I did that presentation to committee members who also happen to be freelance curators here in New York and who work together frequently, Tom Mellons, who's also faculty here at NYSED, and then Donald Albrecht, who had been at the Museum of the City of New York for years and is still associated with the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum. Um, they approached me about using some of the archival material to do an exhibition in the gallery here at NYSED, which is on site just on the ground floor. So that was great. And we set up a 
collections walkthrough. I had them come and I pulled out material from a variety of collections to show them. And after we had that, that in-person meeting, they settled on using the Tom Lee and Sarah Tomerlin Lee collection for the exhibition. So Tom and Sarah Lee were both creatives based in New York City, sort of early to mid 20th century. They had met, let's see, they'd met at, at Bonwit Teller department store, um, which was quite a famous department store here in the 1930s. And at that point, uh, Tom was uh, the window display director for Bonwit Teller. And Sarah was doing sort of advertising and copywriting for the store. So they met there and they went on to have these two like separate careers. They never really worked on projects together, but, but sort of overlapping careers. So Tom, after the window display stuff, he, he branched into set design um, and costume design for theater. He did some fashion design. Um, he did some exhibition design as well, um, some stuff with the, with the New York World's Fairs. Um, and then he ended up going into hotel interior design. He, unfortunately, uh, he had a, was in a car accident in 1971 and ended up passing away. And so Sarah, in her career, she was more sort of, he was the visuals guy and she was kind of the words woman. So she went from um, she did more copywriting and sort of editorial work for Vogue and Harper's Bazaar in the in the 40s and 50s. And then she was the marketing director at Lord & Taylor for a number of years and became the chief editor at House Beautiful magazine um, in the 1960s. And then she said so she had never really done any design work, but she was sort of involved in, you know, they both were kind of tastemakers in New York City. And, and, but then when Tom passed away in 1971, Sarah ended up taking over the um, interiors, hotel interiors firm. And um, she went on to design over 40 hotels in, in the next 20 years, like some really important famous places, hotels for Hilton and Marriott. Marriott. She did the Helmsley Palace Hotel here in New York City, which is a historic um, sort of historic renovation <laughs> project. And then she also designed the Parker Meridian. So both pretty, pretty famous hotels. So she had this kind of amazing design career late in her life. And part of what made uh, the Lees interesting to the curators was just this idea that they that they were um, so influential in New York City and they really were sort of you know trendsetters tastemakers in New York at that time and they also were coming from a place they they sort of shared an aesthetic and actually it, it turns out that we learned from from one of the sons that they would they would actually lived in Greenwich Connecticut and they would actually commute into the city together. Um, driving in the car every day and so they would kind of share ideas in the car and talk over projects and even though they never really worked on on the same project they would sort of then go off to their separate things and sort of implement the their ideas and their aesthetic and so they they had this kind of romantic modernism aesthetic um, we think about modernism as being like themes or knoll quite simple clean lines but they were really interested in more of a juxtaposition of kind of maybe more baroque or um sort of Baroque elements with um, clean graphic things. And so um, it was really kind of a, another take on modernism um, that they called romantic modernism that uh, that was what the curators were really interested in, in looking at and talking about over the course of their two sort of parallel careers. So once the decision had been made to, to do a show about the Lees, um, and oh, I should mention that this, that, you know, because we have their archival collection here, the the goal was to just really pull the whole show from the archives. So um, there was no loaned material or anything else. It was all coming from in-house. So once they had decided on, on the subject, um, I had multiple meetings with the curators over the course of the summer of 2021. Um, I pulled out the whole collection folder by folder and they flagged the items of, uh, that were potentially interesting to them and wrote up a formal proposal that was approved uh, by NYSID and it's a time frame of the fall of 2022. And this was the first exhibition that had been in the gallery for a number of years because of COVID. Uh, once the ball was sort of rolling with the exhibition, I realized it would it seemed pretty important to reach out to um, the sons. Both, both Tom and Sarah had passed away, but they had two sons, Todd and Charles. And I had Charles's contact information from the deed of gift. I wasn't here at the time the collection came in, but uh, but I did have his contact info. And so I reached out to him just to say that this exhibition was happening. And 
And he wrote back and he was like, oh, that's great. And it just so happens I was cleaning out in the basement. I had all this time with COVID and I was home cleaning out the basement. I found all this other additional material, mostly uh, Tom's material, uh, original drawings, renderings, things that were, had been kind of lacking from the, the collection that we had at that point, uh, more visual material. And so he ended up uh, bringing it down and we chatted. We had a meeting with Charles and, and the curators and myself and heard a lot of anecdotal stories about his parents. And it just was a great addition to the stuff that we had had previously. Um, one of the things that came, I just wanted to point out because it's so cool, is this letter that um, Tom had written to his his son Todd, who was the older of the two boys. And um, Tom had been in the UK during World War II. And uh, and so there's this great letter that he wrote with like little drawings that, you know, to his, his toddler son when he was stationed there. So the curators uh, then, um, as they started to flag material that they might use in the exhibition, they started to come into four sort of main sections or themes. Um, design and consumerism, design and domesticity, design and travel, design and diplomacy. There were some additional kind of sidebar themes, like the whole theater design aspect was kind of a sidebar underneath design and consumerism. But for the most part, the material was grouped into these four categories. Uh, and it was around this time that the exhibition design firm Darling Green was brought on board. They have worked at NYSED before quite a bit in the gallery space, so they're really familiar with the space. And um, they started to come up with ideas for what the show might look like and some of the color choices and, and visual themes that they might use. So you can see from the fonts here, these are actually um, headers that were, uh, that were in the show. And they're kind of, again, playing with this sort of romantic modernist aesthetic. So sort of juxtaposing sort of a more, you know, romantic kind of script font with a quite a modern sans serif kind of font. And, and playing around with color palettes and stuff from the period. So around this time was when some of those decisions were being made. Um, and I was sort of at the table for all of these kind of meetings, uh, which was really great to be included in that way. Not so much, you know, volunteering ideas, but at least, you know, sort of soaking in what was decided on in terms of aesthetic choices. We did have a series of in-person sessions around this time uh, with the material that had been flagged for potentially exhibiting and I would lay it out on the tables in the library, sort of in, in the order as best I knew and in the different sections and we would walk through it um, and fine tune, you know, what we needed more of, what maybe would be taken out and sort of a, getting a sense of maybe a layout. And it was around this time also that the events department here at NYSED in seeing some of the rough drafts and direction things were going with the exhibition, we're interested in hearing some sort of alternative narratives about this topic. So the leads were coming from kind of a specific point of view where, you know, white, urban, affluent kind of worldview. And they wanted to hear a little bit more about, you know, what else was going on at this time, particularly, you know, person of color's perspective at, you know, in the 50s and 60s in New York City. And so this idea of having um, context pairings came up and it was it ended up being kind of a large part of the exhibition. So at the start of each of these four sections, there would be some introductory text about that section. And then like two items that were sort of, again, sort of juxtaposed with each other, one item from the Lee's collection and another uh, that was sort of a counterpoint, a counter narrative. So for instance, for design and consumerism, they used a cover of Vogue magazine from the 50s that Sarah had written editorials for. And then the cover of Vogue from the 1970s that um, featured the first African-American model, Beverly Johnson. And, you know, unfortunately that was as late as the 70s that that appeared. But so that was the the context pairing for that. Um, for design and travel, it was um, a brochure from the Colonial Williamsburg Motor Lodge, which Tom had designed in 1957 and was the first motor lodge in the US. But then it, it was an establishment that didn't allow African-American tourists. And so the context pairing for that was the Negro Traveler's Green Book, which some of you may know, I guess there's a movie about the book. I was not actually aware of this until the show. So you know, I, I learned a bit from some of these context pairings, but basically the green book was letting African-American travelers know where it was safe for them to stay in the US. So it really was a, a good addition, I think, to the, to the material. So we're into the summer of 2022. Um, throughout that time, we were sort of finalizing some of the items and, uh, and what order they would be in. 
the curators were drafting the, the caption and the section text, and I was working with them um, at the item level to do background research and, you know, make sure the metadata was in place, dates and things like that for each item. Uh, and then we had a series of meetings, again, like laying everything out on the table and really measuring it for exact dimensions. The design team was going to display the items. Most of them were, were mounted on the wall and they had these kind of plexiglass sandwiches. And so we had to have really exacting um, dimensions for each item to know which, you know, what size plexi needed to be cut for that. I also wanted to mention that um, there's this kind of like project within the project. Most of Sarah's hotel design work, which happened again after, after Tom died, most of the documentation of that in the collection was on 35 millimeter slides. And it just so happened that some of them, mostly the New York projects had, I had had digitized in 2019. So they already existed digitally, but then there were other projects that the curators wanted to include that had not been digitized. And they decided to do like sort of a slideshow of these hotel projects um, presented on a video screen in the gallery. So I worked really closely, mostly just with the curators to like, go through you know all the images we had digitized and also look through the physical slides that hadn't been and decide what I needed to digitize in-house um, and they selected about 65 images of her hotel projects and so I needed I put them together I formatted them and I ended up having to go back to the physical slides to check for photographer copyright information because usually it was like written on the slide like copyright so-and-so. So then I have sort of coordinated all that information so that I could then send it off to the design team to put together the slideshow and also so they had the right info, dates and credits and stuff for the captions. And then came time to get the stuff into the gallery. So uh, late August, um, early September, I you know, was ferrying material down from upstairs to the gallery, sort of helping the art handlers to match up you know, which item is this plexi meant for? And um, there were a few uh, display issues that came up. Like for instance, there's a vinyl record that we wanted to, to have as part of the exhibition. And so sort of, I helped with brainstorming that as far as how to, how to mount it, what's the best way, what's the safest way and um, would look best. So that was kind of, that was kind of cool and interesting. There were some last minute additions. You'll see in this bottom right hand image, there's this wooden kind of finial here on the left. So as teasers were going out about the show and promotional material, postcards and stuff like that were being sent out to announce it, someone who had worked at NYSED for years as the events director um, and had retired maybe 10 years ago, sent me an email and he was like, oh, I'm so glad to see that you're doing the show. And oh, and Sarah, Tamerlan Lee had been connected to NYSID. So, so he was like, oh, I know Sarah. And, and isn't it so funny that this finial in the auditorium here at NYSID was used in one of her interiors. And I was like, oh, like I had no idea that that's what that thing was. It was kind of like hanging out on the wall in the auditorium, like no one really knew. And so it turns out that sure enough, it, it was, it was like a, a mold, you know, they would have made either a plaster cast of it or, or some other sort of cast, um, resin cast. And, um, and so once the curators learned of this, we were like, yeah, it should definitely be in the show. And so, so it was kind of carried over from the auditorium into the gallery. And then I was able to locate among those 35 millimeter slides, an image of the installed finial at the Doral Spa in Florida. And so we ended up printing um, that image and having it displayed next to it. You can kind of see here at the bottom, there's like a little, little red thing. Anyway, that was the, the image of it in situ. Also at that point, I had a little more communication with the Lee family, just coordinating that they'd be able to come to the opening night event. And I have to say, like, it was such, it was such a great experience. I'm so glad that I, that I reached out to them and made sure that they could be there because not only the two sons, but also many of the grandchildren were able to come to the show. And particularly because Tom had died when, when the grandchildren were quite young, a lot of them didn't really know him and they were just so happy to be there um, and to see all of you know, the parent, their parents, grandparents work. And the grandkids were like, you know, we never really knew our grandfather. And we really feel like the show has given us a chance to, to know him a bit. So it was just really gratifying to do that. Um, and to, it was just a really celebratory kind of ending to this whole process of creating the show. So that was the, 
the physical show. And now I want to just talk you through the Omeka exhibition. So the idea for creating a parallel exhibition was actually suggested by um, our library director here at NYSED, Billy Kwan. It had been done once before for a show in 2012 in NYSED's gallery on Neil Prince, who was a designer for the Intercontinental Hotel uh, Corporation. And um, but in that case, most of the material, well, none of the archival material that was used belonged to NYSED. And so the librarians at that time had created an Omeka exhibition, but it was mostly just images of show graphics or pictures of the wall as it was in the gallery. But in this case, because I had access to all the material, it, was, it seemed like a great idea to, to create this exhibition. Also, you know, the online version of the show, not only would it live on in, you know, hopefully perpetuity, but it also had some added value that could be there, for instance, you know, booklets that could only be displayed on the cover showing or like one page, I could sort of scan as full PDFs and upload to the site. So there were certain elements that could be sort of added. I have additional information on the online site. Um, I had never used Omeka before. Uh, I took a workshop at Hunter College about it back in 2016, but I hadn't actually done any, anything in it since then. So I really was kind of figuring it out as I went. So the first step was to choose a template in Omeka. And I don't know if um, I imagine some of you have used Omeka before. There aren't very many templates and they are a little bit limiting I found, uh, but I ended up going with the big stuff theme. Um, I kind of liked this sort of big title and it just seemed like it kind of suited the, the style of the show. From early on, I chose that as the, as the template and I sort of drafted a landing page and I had a series of meetings um, internally, mostly with sort of the content and media external relations team here at NYSA, just sort of asking for feedback and opinions. And so here you'll see the first, the top two images are sort of variations on what the sort of background and the header might look like. Um, it turned out that uh, using that big text was a little, wasn't quite right. And so we ended up going with, um, you'll see here at the bottom is the, the header and background that we ended up using. So in some ways I didn't really utilize the big stuff template um, quite the way I thought, but that was great. I wanted to structure the Omeka site to kind of mirror the structure of the physical exhibition and try to give people um, looking at it online as much of a similar experience as I could. So I ended up having these four sort of sections to the online site as well. I have an, have an introduction and then uh, the four design plus sections uh, and then a credits page. Um, and I quickly realized that having each section be its own exhibit in Omeka was gonna provide me with the most display options and flexibility. I did try to, particularly with the intro and then also with kind of the credits page, at first I thought maybe I should do it as a, as a simple page. Um, but then I, I found that it was too much custom HTML to try to get the text where I wanted it to be. And also the images are quite unstable, uh, adding them in the HTML and the simple page. And so if I just created everything as an exhibit, then I had the option to have pages within the exhibit. And that just gave me a better display situation. So I ended up going with that. You can see here on the bottom right, this is just a typical breakdown of an exhibit with three pages, usually an introductory page, and then um, sort of a his and hers, a Tom and a Sarah page. This wasn't true in every case, but in many cases, I did it like this. And that's kind of, again, mirroring what the physical show was like, because the curators had kind of divided the material into Tom material and Sarah material, again, because they were never really, they were never working on projects together. So it was always sort of like this his and hers thing. So I did mirror that online. And um, on the intro page of each exhibit, uh, I incorporated this title graphic, uh, as you saw from the previous slide. Um, you can see here are the Sarah and Tom sections. And then I had any sort of intro text that the curators had in the physical show, I included here. Um, and then the context pairings were further down as you scroll down the page. They were here on the intro page to the show. Um, it took me a minute to figure out how I wanted to incorporate those, but I, that was what I decided to do. And then also um, 
something that came up in the show was, that, you know, because Sarah was more of the words person, there were all these quotes that they, they wanted to really get a sense of her voice in the show, in the gallery. And so I wanted to incorporate that same voice into the site. But um, in the gallery, they had this whole wall that included all the quotes together. I ended up taking the ones that seemed relevant to the different sections and putting them into that intro page. So yes, you can see from this one, I incorporated one of these quotes here, um, you know, right under the, the title header for that section. So that was kind of how I translated from the physical show into the Omeka site. Also, when it came to the, the Tom and Sarah pages and the actual content, the items, I had a meeting with the curators to sort of talk about what the, the visual rules and vocabulary of the site would be. And we decided that it made the most sense to have images always on the left and text on the right. So the text could be either sort of explanatory text about the item or um, a caption, just a simple one-line caption. And so you were scrolling down through the content, but always with the image on the left. We also decided to add these kind of dividing headers and um, those, and with dates in the headers. And so um, you'll find that almost all of the content on the site is um, chronological, which is not necessarily how the items were displayed, the order they were displayed in in the gallery, but it made the most sense to kind of group the content and sort of show a progression of it online. It, it just was more intuitive or logical to have it be chronological. So that was something that was a little different in the online environment. So once we kind of decided on how everything would appear, then came the work of actually digitizing all the material. Um, again, because I had unlimited access to all the items, basically, it was, it was great that I could just sort of do this uh, without having to coordinate with anyone else. Um, so I had the scanner here at my desk. I set up a whole scanning station. I used the Epson GT 15,000 scanner. And then I found this kind of old Nikon Super Cool Scan 5000 scanner, which luckily still worked. Uh, so between those two things, I scanned everything. And um, I realized early on that, you know, I was going to need to balance sort of image quality with with size concerns uh, in, in Omeka, uh, you know, there's a limit to how much um, space you have. So um, I had decided to do, to scan things as 200 DPI JPEGs. And then as I uploaded them to Omeka, I just sort of tagged each as part of one of those four um, section collections, just to kind of, you know, just in my own mind to know what things went where. We also determined between myself and Billy, the library director, just what our, uh, our metadata standards are going to be for each item. And so you can see uh, here are the seven, the top seven are the ones that were required. And then with a couple of optional um, metadata fields filled in. Uh, with the identifier, I decided to include both the item number from the physical show so that there would be some record of like the display order in the physical show, as well as the box and folder location in the ar in the archives as the identifiers for each item. There were a few things I had to sort of troubleshoot as I was creating the site, some tricky display things. So for instance, when I had scanned something as a full PDF and I went to add the item and I just uploaded the PDF file uh, for the item, um, this, you can see, uh, this is how it would display with this kind of ugly bar at the top and then your ability to scroll through. And so in order for it to look nice on the on each page, I ended up also scanning the cover or a key image as the as a JPEG and then have it adding this caption, click on this image for, for the full PDF. So when you actually, when it would take you to the item, you would see that there were both files available, the JPEG of the, that was the display image plus the P, full PDF. And as far as what I provided full content for. I did have some questions about copyright concerns, but I, I sort of decided, you know, things like catalogs or promotional material was meant to be kind of out there for people to see anyway. So I, I decided I felt kind of okay about that. Um, in some cases with published material, I just provided a, a section of it, um, maybe three or four pages um, and figured if anyone contacts me to say that shouldn't be up, then I can always, you know, adjust. But um, but I tried to provide as much as I could. Another thing that was just a little a little quirky and needed a little bit of um, finessing was uh, with those 
quotes from Sarah Tamerlin Lee and then some other places I needed to sort of do custom HTML for the text spacing um, and size and also color matching. There was like a blue color that was built into the template that appeared in some headings and not in other text. So I had to try to match the blue um, through the HTML source code. And then the site went live. So what you see on this slide is uh, the postcard um, front and back here, and then just a screenshot on the left of the, the finished um, landing page of the site. We decided to wait until after the opening of the physical show to have the website go live, you know, just so that people would come see the physical show and not just automatically go to see it online and, and not come in person, especially because we had an opening night event. That was it. And then I've included the URL here. So please take a look and feel free to send me comments. You'll see my contact info at the end. I believe comments are enabled on the site too, but, uh, but I'd love to hear your feedback um, about the site. All right, that brings us to part three, do it yourself, displays and exhibitions. So some of this, you know, might be familiar, but um, but just you know, when you you have to do a display and where do you start? Just think about you know, think about the story. What what story are you trying to tell? And be selective when it comes to the content. You know, less is more in most cases. So try to think about what's most important to your story. Um, and also, you know, what is the arc of the story? Um, beginning and ending, a middle. Is there certain material that that helps illustrate that story better than others. And that might help you make some decisions about content and editing content. Think about the, the visual order of things, you know, that the eye and the brain, you know, we read left to right and sort of top to bottom. And so keep that in mind when you're thinking about what to include and where to include it, you know, in, in the big arc, are there lots of little arcs, you know, or how, what's the structure? Um, and is your content gonna be displayed chronologically, which kind of lends itself to a linear display uh, thematically or using some other sort of vis visual vocabulary. Like for instance, you know, are items presented in just juxtaposition to each other or counterpoint, like the context pairings in Designing Duo. Um, some of these, like some of the story structure can help influence the actual shapes or arrangement where you put things in your display um, based on sort of where that content is in your story arc or you're kind of, you know, some of the content can help inspire the visuals in that way. There's a lot to say about color. Backgrounds, you know, color can, can unify things and, and visually tie things together by having multiple items on the same color background. Uh, it can also help cue transitions between sections of your display. Uh, for instance, like the way that that color was used for the different sections of Designing Duo, that was, to help you know that that was the end of one section and the start of the next section. Think about that again about backgrounds and about color. You know, often the use of color uh, it can set off black and white items really beautifully. I think that was part of why they they ended up using so much color in the gallery for this show was because a lot of the items were black and white photographs or um, documents, and so. Um, so having a, a color behind can really set something off. Something I, I learned from set design classes, you know, the best setting for a diamond is its opposite, which is black velvet, right? You don't want something that competes with the object. You want something that's gonna really showcase it. Um, something that I found just in my own displays here in the library, um, if I wanted to, if I had an original item and I wanted to, to include it in the display and have it be on some sort of a color background and maybe even you know, on the sides of a case or something like that. Um, I found putting the object into a sleeve and then mounting that sleeve to a color mat background or to actually the, you know, the side of a, of a case um, was a good way to sort of, you know, make sure that the object wasn't compromised, but that you were still able to sort of mount things and sort of use those color backgrounds behind them safely. Think about uh, your palette. Is it reminiscent of a particular historic period? For instance, again, with Designing Duo, you can see this Flair magazine cover that I've included here on the right. Uh, this is in the Lee collection. It wasn't actually used in the show, but you can see immediately how the color palette of this 
object influenced the choices that were made for designing duo um and not just the colors but also um like this duotone image like I, i'm pretty sure this directly inspired the use of those large scale duotone images that you saw in the shots of the gallery and so just just be paying attention to to colors in your uh in your actual archival material, and maybe you know you're pulling some of those out. Um, also, remember that color can evoke mood and feelings, right? So you might want to use a particular color background, you know, like all cool tones, or you know, a contrast of of different things to sort of help evoke some feelings within your display. And then arranging material, you know, obviously content that's displayed next to each other is kind of tied together visually. Uh, think about hierarchy with your content, what's most important to the story, and maybe you're going to make that more visually prominent than something else. And then also um, think about scale. So again, here, here we have one of these duotone images that was in the show. Um, this is a cover of Interior Design Magazine, as you can see. The, the actual um, item wasn't included in the show, but the reproduction of it at a larger scale was. The same with this ad here. This was a Dove Soap ad. And um, the, it was you know, blown up to a larger scale and then that became part of the display. Um, and that's a really interesting choice to use and you know, to play around with, where if you, particularly if you wanna you know, make something more important than another thing, there's no reason that you can't blow it up bigger. You don't necessarily have to use the original or you could use the original plus the blown up section, but it helps you to be able to um, emphasize something or have it be a larger part of your story and your visual display by remembering that that's a possibility. Think about the font that you're choosing and the text and be purposeful with your font choices. This is part of your, your vocabulary, uh, for your visual vocabulary for your display. Not only which font you choose, but also scale. There's no reason that you couldn't take a part of a, a textual document and blow it up bigger and then display that, you know, again, with the original or in lieu of it. And just you can really, you know, call attention to certain things that might be quite small or that, you know, if everything's the same size, it might help you to be able to remember that you can always scan it and and print it bigger and, you know, use that as part of it, part of the display. And whatever you decide to do, just just be consistent with your vocabulary. So if, if you're like, OK, this show is all about, you know, this font, then um, or it's about the juxtaposition of multiple fonts, again, like designing duo, just as long as you're kind of being consistent with those choices. So an example of this, um, I did some small library cases here about um, Sarah Tamerlan Lee and another designer whose archives we have, Emily Molino. Um, this is for Women's History Month. Uh, Emily Molino was, uh, well, I, both of them had books published. So Emily's book was Super Living Rooms, as you can see here, and then Sarah was in edited American fashion. But you, just from the covers of the books, you can sort of see like Super Living Rooms was published in 1976 and it's and it really has that feeling of 1976. And so, um, the text that I included in the case about Emily, I, I chose a modern font with sans serif font, you know, to try to evoke the feeling of this cover. And then with Sarah, again, it was more of that kind of romantic modernism thing. Um, I chose a serif font and a little bit uh, more romantic, you know, of a, a more old fashioned, more classic of a, of a font choice. And so that's my presentation. These are just a couple images. This is the Emily Molino case I was talking about. Um, this was a materials exhibition that I helped with in, um, at Neocon in Chicago. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to hearing your questions.